Welcome to Any Honey and the Newt. Welcome to Any Honey and the New. We were having a lively conversation last time, and uh, I, thought, I think we'll just get right into it. Let's continue our discussion on norms. All right, part two. <clears throat> if it has worked in the past, then it would work again in the future. It's been good enough. The way we have done things in the past have been good enough, so we ought to keep doing them that way. But that ought really isn't justified. Right. There might be changes in circumstances, interactions of cultures, uh, new technologies where doing things the way we've always done them is not the best ultimate outcome. Right. So so there is really no default setting that the way things have been done or the, the normal or typical way of doing things ought to be the way that, that we do things. In fact, that mistake was identified as a logical fallacy, switching from the register of normal to normative and treating them as one and the same is called the naturalistic fallacy. So go a little deeper with what that means. So uh, David Hume would give examples about how, you know, just because nature acts in one certain way uh, doesn't mean that it's, that we can derive an ethics from that. Like there's it, something, so all the white swans in the world doesn't mean that a black swan is wrong and then it's doing it wrong right there, so you can say it's abnormal but it's not um, violating a norm a normative standard and he thought that a lot of arguments relied on making that default assumption that what's normal is also good but he's drawing from this like just because we expect things to work a certain way is not a argument for it to continue acting in that way that's a, like it's a jump in logic to try and make our evaluative standards match descriptive trends. Interesting. I can't help but think of um, one of my favorite uh, comedy sketches of all time was uh, Ricky Gervais. And he uh, grabbed this book uh, that was like an illustrated, uh, basically like every page was an illustration of homosexual behavior in the animal kingdom. And um, because at this time, this was a, do you remember this skit? I vaguely, I, I think I've come across it, but it's been a long time. I want to say he did this in the late nineties, early two thousands when, um, you know, homosexuality was very much uh, a conversation and people were out and proud, uh, but still, I mean, even today, right? It's still taboo in some circles. Uh, some people still don't accept it. Uh, but his the point of his sketch was that like you know because it happens in the animal kingdom it is in fact natural which that was the major argument or i guess it still is it's unnatural right and so thus it's bad and he basically showed all these hilarious images of like dolphin male dolphins humping each other in the blowholes um <laughs> like you know sucking each other off doing all kinds of crazy homosexual behavior and it's hilarious to see animals doing this but at the same time i was like kind of was like eye-opening to me i was like if animals are doing this then it's natural right um and we could go into the the whole conversation later about whether um whether they're breaking cultural norms by doing this be whether they can think or not and be able to do that but even if like you just assume that they can't and your dog walks up to you and starts humping you um and you're okay with that and you deem that as natural <laughs> then then the whole idea of whether that's good or bad should be rethought because like if you're basing on whether it's natural or not, just because something happens only like 25% of the time doesn't mean it's not natural or, you know, in the conversation earlier, uh, just because it's abnormal in the sense that it's rare doesn't mean that it's abnormal in the sense that it, abnormal equals bad. Yeah, no, that's good. So you've, you've, really well characterized one of the reasons why natural law theory isn't really embraced as much i mean there are some proponents but it's it was a dominant theory for a long time and has lost a lot of favor precisely because it becomes hard to denounce anything right if it exists it had to occur in nature somehow right and so if natural is good then 
anything that exists or happens has some kind of justification for it just by by the mere fact of its existence which is kind of it makes it an absurdity like every evaluation then is nonsense um and then also just an example like being abnormal is not always bad like like we recognize this all the time when we give awards to people that do amazing things i mean the guinness world records are filled with people doing abnormal behaviors that are being acknowledged as something as a great feat or an interesting feat uh and then you know statistically we we could point to like kevin durant who has joined the 50 40 90 club i think three seasons two or three seasons which is a, a difficult feat for those uh just to explain what that is that's 50 percent field goal shooting so field goal percentage so shooting uh making at least half his shots for the entire season uh 40 percent from behind the three-point line making you know at least two out of five and 90 percent making nine of ten free throws uh it's only happened i think like a dozen times in the history of the nba and he's done it a few times so this is an elite statistical anomaly but it is not bad like it's really really good right i think uh, even going back to your comment about guinness world records right some of that stuff is classified as taboo right but we're still acknowledging and awarding the achievement purely based on like essentially how abnormal that is happening right yeah so so in general i think the the thing i really want to push and i hope this is an episode that people will, will be able to refer back to later because we'll talk probably in a lot of our conversations about well just because it's abnormal doesn't mean it's uh bad or whatever and also why we emphasize normativity so much i think there's a push from oppressing uh groups and identities and so um abnormal as a slur has become kind of uh well it's been pointed out like that's inappropriate it's offensive to use abnormal as a slur but then the push comes let's just get rid of all norms and I don't know where that jump comes from. Ooh. Getting rid of norms. I feel like that's an impossible task, right? Like as long as there is thinking, there is going to be normativity. Is that not true? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Caught you. True, is, <laughs> true is a norm. Whether or not something is true or false is a norm. Right, so I get caught in, uh, in a <laughs> difficult position there. I think it's true. Uh, it is controversial to say, but to me, that's actually a really critical component of subjectivity and thinking is that there's something normative going on. There's a comparison of what is to other kinds of standards and values and perceptions, and that comparative process in, involves norms. So I'll just, uh, you know, wrap this up by saying tune in next time where I press Corbin into asking if there is the such thing as a universal truth and, and into answering that question. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> is, is, is a universal truth outside normativity? And two, uh, the whole reason we're here in the first place, what the heck does any of this have to do with basketball? <laughs> we have a lot to talk about still. <laughs> So I'll save this question uh, for a future episode uh, because you brought up, you are the one who brought up truth. So I'm bringing you up, I'm pinning you out on this, but um, I'll get you one day to answer whether there is a such thing as a universal truth and whether universal truth <laughs> is part of normative behavior. But uh, before we even bother getting into that, why why do we even care about this from a basketball sense like what does any of this have to do with the game of basketball aside from rules sure yeah it's putting putting truth aside because <laughs> you know, we don't need to be truth tellers do we uh, you know, uh basketball has definitely got a lot of norms to it you know there's the rules of the game but there's also like the etiquette of how things are played and there's things that in in the nba that has its own kind of code of conduct right the way that players play each other you, you hear the different generations like judge you know future or past generations as as being too soft or not being dynamic enough or or different things like that and what they're evaluating is not whether or not they played by the rules 
you know, there's some kind of other code or expectation about how basketball is played on top of the rules and on top of the goal of winning, right? So, so there's all kinds of norms in basketball itself. But I think a really good place to kind of like tease this out is the question of degenerate play. And you and I have talked many times about this, and it seems like an untimely time to be talking about this because James Harden has had a very different kind of year than in the past. But for years, we've talked about James Harden's degenerate play and and whether it was a good thing, a bad thing, and how it impacted the NBA. Um, just, I guess, to be in the spirit of the now, right? Uh, the most close, The closest person I can think of in the playoffs currently who's performing at that degenerate level i think is trey young right he's the the to me he's sort of like the the evolved version of james harden like james harden made this very apparent and so um i guess just real quick when we talk about degenerate play we're talking about um, players who essentially use the rules of the game to uh how would you characterize this like not just to benefit themselves but to like exaggerate the benefits so james harden right is very famous for getting to the free throw line 20 to 30 times a game right when uh, you could say that the normal behavior for superstars is to get to the line 10 to 15 times per game um and even like in elite performances you know kevin durant right he'll get to the line 20 times in a phenomenal game but james harden does that on the regular and, yeah. and it's because, you know, if a defender sticks his hand out, he scoops his hand through and gets a foul call or, um, you know, driving to the basket. He essentially just like falls into the defender to get a foul call. And when you when we say degenerate, like in that case, it's clear to the viewer that he's not making any attempt to score the basketball. He's trying mm-hmm. to get a foul call. So he goes to the line. Right. But the referees are kind of in a tough spot. Um, because the rules are very clear, right? If a defensive player, uh, and I'll say clear subjectively, uh, but the when the defender makes contact with the offensive player, it's a foul on the defender. If the offensive player initiates contact only within a certain specific set of circumstances, is that a foul on the offensive player? And um, so basically Harden has realized like, there's only like two scenarios where I can be called for a foul and everything else is fair game. So I'm going to take advantage of the system. Did I, am I characterizing this right? Did I miss anything? No, I think it's good. I think just for a little bit of context, we want to acknowledge like the game has been evolving since its inception, right? Players are always learning how to make space within the rules for creative play to you know, either have a more effective offense, to add style and flair to the game, to have some kind of an advantage over their competitors. Um, what I think the reason that we identify this kind of play as degenerate is because some experimentation with, within the rules enhances what we think the game is about, the kinds of skills that we think that the game is about. So fancier dribbling you know, uh, adding new moves to the dribble and trying things like dribbling off your knee or bouncing a pass off your elbow behind your back. Those are creative uses of existing techniques and possible ways of playing the game that exists within the rule, but, but goes in a direction, it extends it further. Whereas what we see James Harden doing and other players doing, uh, we might talk about like Draymond Green's defense too, right? Some of the ways that he uses his body to defend players that are bigger than him or faster than him. We say, well, what they're doing either isn't illegal or it flirts with the boundaries of the rules so that it's not clear whether it's legal or illegal, but it also isn't necessarily demonstrating the kinds of skills that we, that the rules seemed like they were set up to facilitate. They're like taking advantage of loopholes or lack of clarity to push the game in a d- direction the opposite of the way that maybe the fans or the the league wants it to go. So if we're looking for a faster paced game, causing a bunch of fouls to get to the free throw line and to make uncontested free throws one point at a time, it's a slow, laborious, uninteresting way to make points. Right? It benefits your team. You can raise your score, 
it benefits your individual stats, but it is no fun to watch. Right. And so I think degenerate there isn't saying that what he's doing is like unfair. That that could be a separate quite a criticism, like is what he's doing fair or unfair? But degenerate, I think, is an evaluation of does this change, does this experimentation follow in the spirit of the game of what we want the game to be? Right. I think uh, to that point, uh, the presence of degenerate players, not just in the NBA, but in I'll say in systems, generally speaking, um, is actually a really important role because it allows um, the rule creators to better define the rules that are part of that system, right? I was actually talking to um, some professionals, some teachers earlier today about how I always perceive uh, kids essentially as degenerate players, right? You set up <laughs> rules for kids and they will find every possible loophole that you've created within that set of rules. And they're not trying to destroy your rule system. They're trying to basically evaluate and understand the world around them. And in doing so, it's in pushing those boundaries that that's where we take notice, right? We only notice that normal or abnormal behavior. And when it's normal, we don't care. When it's abnormal, that's where we're like, red flag, what's happening here? We reevaluate. And so um, so somebody like James Harden, Trey Young, I didn't even think about this until you were describing it, but even like Allen Iverson, right, who with his crossover, people at the time were saying his crossover is a carry, but the referees weren't calling it. And so... You could say it's degenerate because he's really pushing the boundaries of what exactly constitutes a carry. His handle was right on that line, right? So it really made the NBA evaluate what is and isn't a carry. And now we're at the point where, like, at the beginning of every season, the referees call carries to prevent people from doing it throughout the rest of the year. But after the first two weeks, everybody knows that they're not going to call those anymore. <laughs> right. Right. No, I think it, it's a really good point. So, like the rip through that Kevin Durant was famous for, he he's got a tall, uh, you know, he's tall. He's got a lanky body, and is an excellent shooter. And there's a rule where if you get fouled on the shot, you can follow through, and and if you make the shot, you still get the points, and you get to shoot a free throw, right? So, he would rip his arms through a defender's like defensive his hand the defender's hands are out and he would rip his arms through them to create contact and continue through into the shot so in one continuous motion he's getting the shot call but he's the one causing the contact and there was nothing the defender could do the league actually after i think two years of that said yeah no that's that's illegal it's um did they call it an offensive foul or did no. they just say it's not foul yeah, they call it not continuation, which I disagree with. Like, because the premise of that fixing of that rule, right, is that Kevin Durant's creating the contact, I don't understand why they didn't just go ahead and say that that's an offensive foul. Right. They're acknowledging well, that. That's what I was gonna, yeah. <laughs> that's what I was going to get to. I think now, so they did go that far, right? They wouldn't call it an offensive foul, but you weren't getting the benefits of, of causing that contact. Well, now we have shooters that will kick their leg out when they shoot a three and then fall down or will lean into somebody and change their body direction in order to cause that contact in part because after a horrific injury, we've made some rules to protect players. So not only can a defender not hit a player, they can't be in their landing area when the player is coming down, right? They basically can't be anywhere in their circle of, of motion. And so if an offensive player is changing directions mid shot and causing contact or causing them to be in their landing spot they're getting the benefit of these fouls and sometimes getting three or four shots you know three shots or three points in a, an extra shot um oh. i think the league's gonna evaluate that this year yeah they actually started talking about it and uh, just to to kind of demonstrate how degenerate that sort of thing is i actually came across like a really short study of james harden's shooting recently and they found that like when there's no defender within proximity of james harden he uh, jumps and lands in the same spot. But when there's a defender, I think it's within five feet of him, his landing spot changes by an average of two feet from where, wow. he, where he jumped from, which means that he is going out of his way to create you know, contact with the defender, whether it's because his defender runs into him or he's initiating the contact. 
Um, I think we can all agree that he is creating the contact, but like that's an example of like why the rule is being looked at so carefully. Like, what makes this unnatural? What makes this abnormal? And whether that abnormality plays into the I'll just go ahead and say it the subjectivity of what makes the game entertaining does it make it more or less so yeah I think the <laughs> just to avoid making the mistake that we warned about early in the episode <laughs> I don't think we want to say it's the abnormality of the action they might use not a normal basketball move to help identify but it's not the abnormality that's wrong it's that it's violating some kind of norm of fair play or um safe play or something like that yeah that's a a really good distinction and i can't believe i'm so ashamed i fell into the my own trap (laughs) i actually even used the word unnatural too which uh faux pas on me (laughs) (laughs) well i mean this is why it's so important to parse right because unnatural basketball move or not a natural basketball move is kind of one of the criteria that they use but it's because it's not because what's normal is normative, but that observation of the norm of what is normal helps the referee determine whether or not a different normative standard is being upheld or not. It's so fascinating to me that, um, you know, we were able to have this conversation about, you know, just in general, how normativity essentially arises from a thinking system. Um, and we didn't really mention this and I'm just going to go ahead and mention it now that it's starting to become apparent to me just how, um, essential normativity is in literally everything, right? You can like point to anything and pick out normativity, uh, as aspect of it. Uh, I was watching, uh, I forget what movie it was very recently. Oh, Quiet Place 2. I was watching the movie Quiet Place 2, and it dawned on me while watching that movie that some aspects of, you know, especially the plot, right? Themes are a little bit different, but especially within the plot of movies, um, when the plot starts to reveal holes in itself, it's because they're not, like, adhering to their own normative system, their own rule set that they create. Right. And that becomes infuriating. And we always praise well-written movies. And those typically have the best defined norms. Or in some cases, they're so poorly defined that they make it work. Right. That's like uh, essentially it's it's the norm to be. I don't want to say unnormal, but, you know, like poorly defined (laughs) in that case. (laughs) Yeah. No, it's you're right that we can find norms pretty much anywhere, even like this podcast. Right. And what? I don't know if <laughs> I don't know if viewers noticed or not, but uh, we started the episode by break, breaking one of our norms. Instead of me doing the welcome and intro, you did it. And uh, there are other norms. I'd be curious if our listeners have picked up on things that we normally do. Right. And then if the kinds of things that we have a standard for what we want out of the podcast and what we're striving for. So I'd, I'd be curious if people have identified the normal things and our normative standards. And if you do drop them in the comments, I actually would be really interested to know if like there's behaviors that I do every episode as a, <laughs> both a normal behavior and a normative behavior. <laughs> <laughs> the normative ones are basically where I say something outlandish and you're like, well, let's just uh, back that up a second. <laughs> <laughs> You mean when you make it entertaining and I play school mom? (laughs) I picture you showing up uh, uh, in your soccer mom van, picking me up for podcast practice. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Well, let's, uh, let's end it there. And we have a lot more to talk about subjectivity in future episodes.